So remember Ephesians 5.3 is listing the sins that Paul warns, let it not be named amongst the church, and these sins are common in churches, and ministries have been caught doing this. So I've, I've explained with some names as well. So this should not be named amongst our church. So these are very common ones, and you have to keep an eye out for these things and not allow it to happen. Now verse 4 is going to be important because a lot of people, they think that these things are absolutely necessary in order to enjoy a good time. That's the problem with people nowadays. They think that in order to have a good time and find happiness in life is where they endorse and immerse themselves in sin. Now, you ever thought of that? A lot of people, the reason why they don't want to become Christians is because they think that it's so religious and dry, <clears throat> that it's weird, and that you're not going to have any fun in life. One thing that's important to understand is that fun does not equal joy. That's one thing you got to understand. Don't you know that people, that because that they laugh and they have fun, that deep down inside they can just be as empty as hell? They can be empty and they're just doing it to fill the void. They're laughing to fill the void. They're, use, they're go seeking after sin, something filthy, to fill in the void. And they think that fun equals sin and comedy. This is so common in, amongst our wicked world. The wicked world thinks that you have to have something dirty and you have to have comical in order to have fun in life, which is true, so to speak, but they mistake that to equal joy, true joy. God gives you a different solution to find true joy compared to sin <clears throat> and comedy. So let me explain one by one. So verse 4 is good for you, especially if you're drawn into the world, especially if you don't feel like this church fits you. And then you want to go to a church that appeals your flesh, that gives you some sort of fun, that meets your taste. Uh, that's not true joy. You have to understand that. So let's look at this. Verse 4, neither filthiness. So all sorts of filthy stuff, dirty stuff. It could even relate to something sexual. Nor foolish talking. People think that you have to talk a lot even to the point of foolishness. <clears throat> Act like a fool in order to have fun in life, to be happy. Nor jesting. So making jokes, being comical. Now, the last part of the verse is, which are not convenient. It's not convenient, but people do these things for convenience. That's important to understand. See, this is what people want. It's not more so fun, it's more so of convenient. What is convenient for me, for my flesh? What draws a person back to that mega church? Oh, that pastor's funny. Oh, that pastor doesn't hurt my feelings. Oh, Christians are too legalistic. So I want, so so I want something that's more fun to my taste. You mean sin. You want that contemporary music. You want uh, the worldly dressing. You, some preachers even put within worldly conversation. Can you imagine, man, all this kind of foolish stuff going around? And there is foolish talking amongst churches nowadays. And people think this is that, the person that's fun to hang around with or I want to be friends with is the guy who talks the most or who acts like a fool. This is all done for convenience. People like something convenient, but God says that that is not the case. It's not convenient. The opposite effect should be giving up thanks. Look at that last part. That's the key but rather giving of thanks. That's what God says. He be God believes this. God believes that in order to find convenience in life, 
See, true convenience is not found in this. What? In order to have a convenient life, it's to give thanks and praise to the Lord. Yes. Amen. When you give praise to the Lord and give Him the glory that He deserves, then you realize how convenient life is. And you realize how much joy you have in life. You know why you don't have much joy? You're the typical wicked world. You immerse and drown yourself out in comedy and in sin. And the Bible also mentions uh, foolish talking. So you have to talk so much to the point where it's foolish. Yeah. You believe that this is necessary to have a convenient life. It's convenient for you. It makes things fun for you. It makes things enjoyable. But God says that's not convenient. He says that to find convenience is to give thanks. Why? Because he deserves all the glory. That's one. Number two, it's because you're discontent. That was the key reason why. You know what the problem with America is? You are a bunch of discontented brats and snowflakes, and I'm sorry to say that. Amen. Oh, that includes you. Yes, sir. Absolutely right. In America, we're prone to a machine where it feeds the flesh. I want something better on the TV advertisement. I want something better on the internet that's more catchy. Used to be MySpace. Now they're pretty. Uh, now the other parts are out. Instagram. Why? It, it's more convenient for my flesh. See, that's the problem of Americans. They're not contented people. They're on high demand for something more uh, pleasing to their flesh. And that's very, very dangerous. You have to stop and realize that you're on a dangerous road where it's going to a point where you'll forever be spoiled and you'll never be satisfied. That's dangerous. To be satisfied in life is to stop and be content. How do you be content? Give thanks. You know why you don't have a convenient life? You don't think about all your blessings that you're thankful for. You know why I enjoy my church? Not because we're funny. Not because we enjoy a lot of talking, even though we do have some of that. And I'll explain a little bit more uh, each reason, okay? That, some, that it is good things what we're doing in some of these things, but not all. But I'll explain that a little later. First, I just have to explain this part about giving thanks. It's not all the talking that we have, because I've been to churches where they hardly talk. And then I enjoy fellowship. It's not because uh, we're funny. Because I've been to churches that are just deadbeat serious, and I enjoy a sermon. Look, uh, I don't know if you've heard of Evangelist Jim White or you've heard uh, Bill Eubanks and some of these people, but they're funny. They're very funny. Yeah. And I enjoy their preaching so much. Yeah. Alan Ryman, funny. All right? He's the highlight, pretty much, uh, of the revival meeting that people want to listen to. Kyle Stevens, he's not funny. <laughs> but do we get a blessing? Yeah. Yes, we get a blessing. Because we don't depend on these things for joy in life. We're thankful yes. for our preacher, yes. for the people God put in our life, the church. Yes. You look at too many flaws and you try to find something that's funny to you or who does more foolish talking or something that's dirty. And these are the kind of crowds that you got to get away from. That's not convenient for you in life. But you're deceiving yourself thinking that's the convenience for you. That's, that's cool. a convenient life. That's wicked as hell. What if you're at a church where people don't talk? I've been to those churches. People don't talk. Because perhaps the culture is different or just people are different. They're more serious-minded people. But I can enjoy fellowship. I don't know about you. You might say, how so? Because I give thanks to the Lord. Yes. I'm saved like they are. I'm at a place where we talk something clean. I don't have to worry about something where they're going to talk something liberal or wrong, wrong doctrine. I'm at a uh, place where I just focus on the Lord. Yeah. I'm not by myself anymore. Like a lot of onlineers who are suffering through loneliness. And they want just Bible-believing people around them. I mean, if I keep thinking about that, then I realize, man, this is a great church to be in. What a convenient life. Yeah, we're blessed. Amen, Amen, brother. That's how you should think. When you do that, 
then what happens right here? Yeah. You enjoy convenience. You can enjoy a convenient life. It doesn't matter about our cultural age gaps. I keep saying that over and over again. I look forward to the time when I play with the uh, kids in our church. It doesn't have to be people my age. I always look forward to the time when I always talk to an elderly person in the church. Why? Because I try to focus on the good points that I'm thankful for. What can I enjoy? They're saved like me, blood-bought like me. Yes. Some of them pray. Uh, the elderly people, it's a blessing that they would pray for you when they're bed-stricken. And it's a blessing when you see little kids, you know, singing hymns. Mm. See that? That's greater joy than this kind of stuff. Yeah. But people think you need this for a convenient life. When you think like that, you'll never be happy. You'll never enjoy, truly enjoy convenient life. It's not convenient, the Bible says. What's convenient is giving thanks. Start doing that. And trust me, your perspective in life will change. You'll enjoy the food you eat, the living situation you're at, uh, even the job situation you're at, the money that you have, the people that you have, and everything has imperfections. But guess what? So do these things too. These things have imperfections. And you're going to find something that you don't like. And then you're going to seek something darker and darker right here, heavier and heavier right here, and heavier and heavier right here. And then what kind of person are you going to turn out to be? You're going to turn out like some of those comedians who shot their brains out, right? Because they think that to find joy in life is to act all comical. So let's go to here at this text. So verse 4, each pointer... Let's cover neither filthiness. So obviously, filthiness is sinful and it is wrong. And that should not be justified. So God wants filthiness out of the picture. But there is a sense where it is, so to speak, quote unquote, justified. So that's where people get confused. They think verse 4, filthiness, foolish talking, or jesting means absolutely nothing of that, period. So let me explain the balance here. Now, sin is not justified, obviously. Yeah. But then it says filthiness. So let's use our heads now. Obviously, filthiness is wrong. We shouldn't use filthiness. But let's be honest. Didn't Paul mention something <clears throat> filthy? Go to the book of Philippians. Keep your hand here. Go to Philippians. Mm. Chapter 3. Philippians chapter 3. There's something you don't understand. This... The world thinks that, oh, Christianity is so boring, so you're saying that I shouldn't joke one time, and that uh, in life that I cannot even say something this hard when I feel like it, or you're saying that we can't enjoy a long conversation and laugh about it. No, the problem is this. See, these people, when they go up this ladder, they're so focused on this. That's their focus in life for convenience. God says the focus should be giving thanks. That's the focus. But it does not mean that you cannot talk and enjoy a long conversation. Not everyone is John Wesley. John Wesley did not believe in talking more than 30 minutes. You might say, why is that? Because that man believes that the more that you talk, something foolish might accidentally come out that you don't intend to. So that guy was so holy, so that was his rule, is that not to talk more than 25 minutes. That was his uh, conviction. But this doesn't mean that the Lord forbids people from talking to each other hours and hours of fellowship. Uh, comedy. This doesn't mean that people cannot joke or use humor. And this might surprise you. Even something filthy is justified here and there, which might be shocking to you. Because look at Philippians chapter 3. Let's look at verse 8. Verse 8. Yea, doubtless, and I, call, uh, I count all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and do count them but what? Dung, that I may win Christ. Notice that the Apostle Paul, that he used something filthy in Holy Scripture. Did you hear what I just said? Holy Scripture. Use something filthy. 
Now, if you think that uh, that's pretty extreme, you don't know what extreme is. Did you, re did you read the major prophets, the language of God, when he rebuked the nation of Israel? This is God himself speaking. He mentioned that their righteousness are nothing but filthy rags. Right. And actually, I don't know if some of you knew this, but that was referring to uh, menstruated cloth, so to speak. Yeah. This was really, I mean, the Lord will use uh, filthy stuff. Is it because he's a filthy God? No, get your mind out of the gutter. Right, right. You're so focused here. God, if you're focused here and something holy and spiritual, some of these things you'll know when to use it in line in the right context as a proper Christian. Okay, why did Paul say dumb? Because God wants you to understand how filthy it is in his eyes that he says that's how wrong it is. That's what he, isn't it interesting what he said about when he used the strong language dung at Philippians, when he mentioned all our righteousness are filthy rags? That was referring to man's self-righteousness. That's how much God hates it. Like filthiness, wickedness, uh, dark sexual stuff, that was just taken for granted. The Lord will say it's filthy, it's evil. But he uses strong language for, what, self-righteousness. He hates that way more. So it's at the right context. Sometimes your preacher will use harder language, right? Sarcasm. And that's justified. Why? To show you how much God hates it, how wrong and evil it is that people ha have been... You know what the problem with people are? They've been programmed to justify and make clean good works and wrong doctrine. But when it comes to filthy humor, filthy language, filthy sexual stuff, they think that's justified and we should keep that. You know what kind of... You are... You are programmed to insanity, this wicked world. You got to switch it around. You got to put the filthiness upon what is truly filthy and wrong. You got to make it that bad and that evil, but you don't. Oh, you're too hard on some of the preachers. I mean, they love Jesus. Yeah, so did the Pharisees. They love God. They love God, but Jesus Christ rebuked them harder than prostitutes. See, you got to put your, you've been programmed wrong because you think preachers are so holy that it's untouchable. Wow. And then you've been programmed to keep cussing, using filthy language, laugh at filthy humor. Come on, brother. Especially some of you onliners, that's, that's weird to me. You onliners get upset at me when I go hard and point out the filth of, uh, and when I actually use some hard language, and hard humor on some of these preachers, you say, oh, that's just wrong. But then when it comes to uh, filthy humor on the next YouTube video clip that you guys watch, you laugh about that and you think oh. that's okay to let go. Oh, but when I preach hard and use hard language on yeah. wrong doctrine and false preachers, you think that should not be let go. You've been programmed wrong. How many dislikes have I got online already? All right, go back. All right, go back. Now, foolish talking. The key is this. The Bible says at the book of Proverbs, I don't know the passage, but uh, you can pretty much uh, just write a small note on that. The Bible says, multitude of words, there wanteth not sin. When you talk a lot, there's going, sin will pop out somewhere. Yeah. So that's why it's a matter of control. So look, there's nothing wrong with talking. The Bible says that the... They exhorted themselves with fellowship. And people have been doing that every day. The apostles have been doing that. So there's nothing wrong with talking for hours and hours and a long time. But the thing is this, there's a tendency there. A tendency where you talk too much that all of a sudden you say things more loosely that you shouldn't have said. And then it hurts somebody's feelings. Amen. Or you said something that was inappropriate as a Christian. So that's why you have to control that. See this scale? The point is using the scale here. It's a, it's a matter of balance. What are you using it for, right? When you do that, then talking much, I mean, sometimes, let's be honest, it could sound and appear like foolish talking if we uh, talk about, you know, our pet cat 
the foolish thing that the pet cat did that was so funny and we all laugh about that. So that can be a little bit of foolish fun, but at what context? That's the thing. The context is it used appropriately. Same thing here. I even use the most extreme example. This can be used, but to what, ex to what ex uh, context? What situation? That's what explains the next part. So we understand filthiness, that it's used at the right context, foolish talking right context, but the next part, jesting, is also used at the right context. So comedy, joking around, that's jesting. So why did the Lord put that as not convenient? Very simple, because like I told you, people think that's, that's their focus in life. And when that is done, then that's what the Lord rebukes. Good example, uh, there was this one comedian who was very funny, and he did so much joking. But the point is, it's, joy it's joking to a point that has no worth. You're just joking. You just feel like that you have to insert a joke to enjoy life. That's where it gets wrong. It's that you just joke for the point of it, just, uh, just without, point, uh, without any point to it. You just want to joke it out. And then one comedian, when he was asked about why he would, where did he get his jokes from, his comical style, he just says that uh, he just, uh, he'll just joke 24-7. He just laughs even when it's pointless and that he'll laugh. That's why some of these people, you think they're a little, little weird. You go to uh, Robin Williams, Jim Carrey, some of these guys. Yeah. I mean, very funny, some of these guys. But then you can tell, and it's easy to tell when they're joking, that, look, you're just being pointless now. Right. You're just forcing it. Yeah. That's the problem. So that's the key then. The key is, is that in filthiness, foolish talking, jesting, it's just that is your complete focus in life. If that's your complete focus in life, if that's what dominates your life, then that is sin, that is wrong. Yeah. That's the problem there. If that's the dominant thing in your life. I would, uh, here's a great thing to do, okay? how you can tell you're off balance. You ready? This is the easiest to tell if you're off balance. Do you give thanks more than you do these things? Mm. Very good. Uh, when you do that, then you'll know you're out of balance. Yeah. Then you'll know your focus in life, what you're focusing on. You're focusing on these to keep life going rather than this. Then you know you're way out of balance. So in life, uh, comedy, there's nothing wrong because there are plenty of examples in scriptures is that if you, uh, for example, if you look at the book of Genesis, uh, God told Abraham that you're going to have a child. Abraham laughed, and so the Lord thought it'd be nice to laugh back at him. Why don't we name your son Laughter? You know what Isaac means? Laughter. The Lord has a sense of humor. The Lord has a sense of humor. Humor is actually a great asset as well. The Apostle Paul, when you go to, uh, let's look at this example. Go to Acts 16. Let's go to Acts chapter 16. Here's another example from Scripture. Paul used humor, and it was a great asset. Because Paul, he actually... Now, this is some kind of extreme humor here, but it got his point across. He allowed these people, these officials, city officials, to beat him, and he let them beat him. But actually, he could have gone away with it. He had a legal right. He says, it's illegal that you beat me uh, before uh, proper questioning because I'm a Roman citizen. But they beat him without doing proper questioning. But Paul, he saved that because he wanted to publicly shame them. Man, look, look at the dark humor he had there. That's some dark humor. Like, look at uh, verse 36. And the keeper of the prison told this saying to Paul, The magistrates have sent to let you go. Now therefore depart and go in peace. Verse 37. But Paul said unto them, They have beaten us openly and condemned, being Romans, and have cast us into prison. And now do they thrust us out privately? Nay, verily, but let them come themselves and fetch us out. You know what he basically said? 
He basically say, hey, Biden, Harris, why don't you come down over here and give me an apology said, instead in public? Until then, I'm just going to stay right over here and show that you've done so many illegal actions against me. <laughs> Look at that, man. This is awesome. This is laughter right here. This is humor. Verse 38, 39, guess what? They came out, they apologized, and went out publicly with Paul to show people that they've done the wrong. Ha uh, ha, exactly. That's something to laugh about. So humor can be an asset. In sermons, there are times where preachers use humor. Why? Because it can be a great asset. But uh, here's something that you don't know about. Evangelist Jim White, great preacher, but even he said one time that he felt like the Lord dealt with him at a point where he's been using too much humor, so he's got to calm it down. See that? So that's why the important thing is this, is that there's nothing wrong with using these things, but you have to make sure they're not the dominant point, in, they're not the focus in your life. That's the key. Right. If they're the focus in your life, then that becomes an issue and a problem. Amen. All right. Let's go back to Ephesians 5. Okay, so I, exp I gave a lot of explanation here, but I hope that made you understand now. But it's also a va valuable practical lesson in life. How to enjoy life, how to feel more fulfilled, and that these things, there is a balance to it. There's a balance to it. Amen. Now let's go to Ephesians chapter 5, and then we'll read uh, verse 5. For this ye know that no whoremonger. So Paul's saying there is something that you do know. And what you do know is that no whoremonger, so that's sex outside of marriage, nor unclean person, that's a person who's filthy. The context is following three and four, as you can tell. Context is following three and four. The sins of America, basically. Okay, that's three and four. So, unclean person, that's delving into dark, uh, filthy stuff. Nor covetous man, that's a person coveting things that you don't have, but you want it. Interestingly, the Bible says, who is an Id idolater. Ah, did you see that? Now, I don't know if you knew this, but covetousness is idolatry. Covetousness, friends, is idolatry. So this typical American, who's all into this in life, will obviously also have this too. His imagination runs wild, and don't say that you don't do this. And then you see a TV commercial, and then you go, oh, I want that house. Because the Bay Area just stinks, man. And I hate my stinking apartment. Why can't I have a nice house one day? One, your thoughts are too low. You should be looking up there. Yeah. House? You got a mansion up in heaven. I don't know what you're looking at. That's one. Uh, number two, the reason why covetousness is idolatry is because what is idolatry? Idolatry is basically something that you worship, you adore, something that's uh, focused, more exalted, more focused than God. That's an important note. If that's the idea, think about it. That makes so much sense why covetousness is idolatry. You might say, why is that? Because the reason why is you adore, you practically, I mean, let's be honest, even we use this in our everyday language, like Americans practically worship Hollywood. They worship their celebrities. You know, why people say that? Because they adore these people so much and exalt them so much to a point that, wow, I want to be something like that. And then uh, sad, uh, sad, so many sad cases of women today not being happy with the natural beauty God gave to them. Women today trying to dress more worldly, more wicked, more sexual because of what they saw on TV with what they coveted, either a model or celebrity star. Um, same thing with the guys as well. So this is something where, why covetousness is idolatry. It is idol worship. Why do you think Hollywood are called idols? No. Hollywood idols. Good teaching. So, 
we know now what idolatry is. It's something where you worship to a point or it's exalted to a point. That's why, I don't know if you've heard this before, if you've heard of preachers or sermons that might say, oh, you don't worship idols. I'm not saying that like wood and stone, like you worship to this idol, but you do have idols in your heart and that is uh, basically a sin that you're struggling with that you believe is more important than God or something in this world that you love more than God. You ever heard of so many sermons like that? Yeah. Like the idol of TV, the idol of a good jo job, the idol of your flesh, the idol of friends, the idol of yeah. get rid of that thing and make God the Lord over your life and cast down these idols. There is a truth to that statement. Yeah. The truth to that statement is this verse. This verse is tr it shows what the idolatry is. It's covetousness. What is covetousness? Something that you exalt or you prioritize or you make it practically a God in your mind that you love and adore that you don't have. That's good. So, that, so when we talk about idols in your heart, spiritually speaking, it does doctrinally as well in the Word of God, that matches. Yes. And the verse to prove it is this one, if you want to use next time, okay? It would be this verse at verse 5. All right. So, I, so guess what? Pretty much all of you are idol worshipers. Yeah. I hope not. I hope I'm wrong. Yeah. But pretty much yeah. every one of you has an idol somewhere that you need to repent and get right with God. Yeah. And you need to make God the Lord over your life. Yeah. What is the idol in your heart that you need to cast down and get right with God? All right, let's keep reading. So these people, whoremonger, unclean person, nor covetous man, who is an idolater, so that's everyone, guilty as charged, hath any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and of God. Now, the people who have covetousness issues, they do not gain an inheritance. Look at this. Their focus is in the wrong place. If they were coveting for the right things, so to speak, looking and enjoying the right things, it should not be here. It should be up there. Right. It should be the glorious kingdom of God. Now this place is like a thousand if not a million times bigger than this pitiful little house that you're looking at. I mean, what are you focusing on, man? What are you focusing on? So the Lord has something beautiful prepared for you up in heaven. He's got an inheritance laid out. But the problem is, is that uh, you don't enjoy the inheritance that the Lord has given to you. You lose your focus on the inheritance. You keep your focus on the things of this world, the treasures of this world, when you shouldn't be looking at the treasures of this world. Some people will say that this, if you, you do these things and you can't go to heaven, that's what they take it as, but they're not reading the verse. The verse says, hath, if you do these sins, you cannot, what, hath, what, any inheritance. That's the key. So it's not losing heaven. Right. No matter what sin you commit, if you receive Christ for your salvation, that's all you're trusting in is his shed blood. Not on how well you live. Right. Then you're relying on your works. So you've got to realize that once saved, always saved. Right. No matter what sin you commit. So you're not going to lose heaven, but there is something you lose, and that's the inheritance. So you lose the inheritance up there. Notice that the verse says inheritance where? At the kingdom. So the inheritance that's in the kingdom. God's kingdom has an inheritance for you of Christ and of God. So Christ and God, they're always combined together. That proves Jesus Christ's deity. He's just not a normal man. Right. He is definitely uh, at a God status. He's close with God. When the kingdom belongs to God, it belongs to Christ as well. So this kingdom belongs to Christ and God, but they have an inheritance for you in this kingdom. Are you going to get the inheritance of the kingdom? Are you going to get the inheritance of the kingdom? Uh, for some people who might be confused because the tendency is to look at the latter part of verse 5, inheritance of God 
and inheritance of Christ. So they think that there are two inheritances that you're missing out at verse 5. That's pretty possible. Some people might think that way. But the inheritance focus is not the word Christ and God. It's kingdom. Inheritance in the kingdom. So the idea is the kingdom's inheritance that you lose. So it's not an idea where you lose two different inheritance, Christ and God, in case some people might be worried about that. Going back to the main text, let no man deceive you with vain words. So Paul warns, don't let people trick you, deceive you, vain words. You notice that? Words that are vain, it has no worth. What is it? For because of these things, ah, all these sins Paul was talking about. Right. It's these things. So Paul's saying people are going to trick you that, hey, isn't that funny? Laugh along with me. Come on. Hey, why don't you hang out with us? We're going to have a great time. Let's act like fools for one night, you know, drink and do something crazy. You know, something naughty. Filthy. Oh, come on, hang out with me, huh? Uh, why don't you drop by my place at the middle of the night? You see this? Yes. All this? You know what? The Bible, uh, covetousness, don't forget your little idol, whatever your idol is. Mm -hmm. And then it deceives you. Don't you want to do that again? Isn't it fun? Isn't it a great time? You know what God said? <laughs> vain. It's all vain words. Yeah. You know why it's vain? I'll tell you why. They're all going to burn. Yes. Amen. They're all going to burn at the end. Some fun that would be, huh? Yes. Can you take these at the grave with you? You can't. But you take Jesus to the grave with you for all eternity. He's inside you right now, and he'll take you up to glory. So this is all vanity. So you got to realize, don't let people trick you with all this. Remember this, they're vain. Tell yourself that. Mm -hmm. Keep reading. The Bible says, for because of these things, it's because of all these wicked things, Cometh the wrath of God upon the children of disobedience. So it's because of all these things, God's wrath falls upon the children of disobedience. Remember, the lost world is designated as children of disobedience. So I cover that at Ephesians chapter 2. Why are they children of disobedience? Because they disobey God. They don't listen to him. They don't obey him. They constantly, when they live in these sins, it's a life of disobedience. It disobeys God. So you got to remember this. Whenever you follow into the vanity of this world, just know this. You are disobeying God. You are not obeying him, what he wants you to do. So being a child of disobedience, God's wrath falls on them. So why does... As America gets more wicked and gets more heavy into this and more sensitive about holy preaching, guess what? God's wrath is building up higher. And the damnation is hell. Man, that's scary, right? That's why it's not a good idea partaking in this kind of stuff. Right. Because God damns a person forever in hell, these lost people, for that. Now, thank God that's not you. Because why? You're not the... Ch children of disobedience you're the children of god once you're a child of god the holy spirit he does not see sin in your outer flesh because that's not the real you that's not the real child the real child is the inner man the holy spirit and the holy spirit is pure holy clean and it's separated from your sinful flesh that's why no matter how many sins you commit in your sinful flesh god does not count sin in you because he does not see that as the real child. The real child he sees is the one inside this outer flesh. And that's the Holy Spirit nature. You know what happens to this child? This child turns to dust. That's not, this is not God's child. So understanding that the context is children of disobedience, verse 6. So that's why we don't have to worry about God's wrath. So that's why we're delivered. But verse 7, that's why God warns you about that. Be not ye therefore partakers with them. Right. So God says, he warns you, because my wrath falls upon children of disobedience, you see how I damn them with hellfire, how I take it seriously, these sins. That's why I'm telling you, 
Look, don't partake in these things. That's how much angry I am with that. So don't partake in that bunch. Verse 8, For ye were sometimes darkness. Uh -huh. That's very true. Were, past tense. Before we got saved, we were of this kind of lifestyle. We were in that darkness. This is all considered darkness. And sometimes we just made, re we fell really deep into that. But now are ye light in the Lord. God considers you as you are in the light of Jesus Christ. So because you're in the light, the verse says, walk as children of light. So God says you're supposed to walk. You're supposed to walk as children of light, therefore. So this is all considered darkness. And you got to get out of that. And you got to get into the light. This is the path you should be going. You shouldn't go back. There's a song that goes, uh, No turning back, no turning back. I have decided to follow Jesus. So this is where you should be going, friend. Go to 1 John 1, 1 John 1. Now it's important that the Bible says walk as children of light. Did you notice that? It's walk as children of light. Some people think this. Some people think that, and this is the problem with Paul Washer and some of these heretics, and I'm sorry if I hurt your feelings, but again, I'm not going to explain why I go hard on wrong doctrine and false creatures. But the problem with these people is that they think that if you walk, if your Christian walk goes into darkness, then automatically their logic is you're a child of darkness. That's what they think. Now... No, you're not. The Bible says that you're considered to be children of light. We totally disagree with this. We believe that you're a child of light. You might say, why is that? Because I already explained it here. Because Jesus is the light, not you. So Jesus, our salvation is dependent upon not what you do, it's on Jesus Christ. If it's dependent upon Jesus Christ, and Jesus Christ is in you, you're made of his nature as soon as you received him for your salvation, you're automatically light. But the idea is this, it's not the flesh. The flesh is never of light. It's the spiritual nature. People never divide the two natures. If you don't divide the two natures, you go into way, uh, you go into way heresy. You got to understand the dealings of the two natures. Flesh is never, listen, flesh is never of life. It's wicked, it's evil, it's dark. So guess what? Is your flesh evil and dark? Yes. Is the spiritual nature inside you of light, holy, pure? Yes. So guess what? You're going to commit two things. See, you're either going to, uh, you can either commit the action. See that word walk? Walk is an action. Right. So you can commit the action. You can walk in darkness or you can walk in light. You can do either or. People think that, oh, it's impossible to do this. No. <laughs> Don't tell me, Paul Washer, you never thought one dark thought ever oh. in your life. Like never, ever. Yeah. They give this kind of excuse that, well, you know, uh, I'm not saying that nobody, uh, nobody ever sins. Of course, we sin here and there. But if you tend to do things that are holy and pure, people consider you and label you as holy and pure person or a safe person or a child of light. If you tend to do things in the light, then you're known as child of light. That's how Paul Washer logically makes it. But look, to God... 
If he says light, then that means this light has to be pure, not even 1% of darkness. God's holy, uncompromising. God's not going to think, oh, if I let a little bit of darkness over here, it's still considered light. No. God's like, no, light is light, and guess what? Darkness is darkness. Period. The better answer, well, the scriptural answer, actually, his answer is not even an answer. So the right answer, the scriptural answer is that you have two natures inside you. The spiritual nature is of light, but the fleshly nature is never of light. It's of darkness. It commits dark acts. So you can act in darkness or in light. Does that mean you're a child of darkness when you act in darkness? No, you're considered child of light. Why? Because God is only looking at the spiritual nature inside you, not your fleshly nature. He considers you his child because he keeps looking at this, the work of Jesus Christ, not your work, not what you do. And thank God for that. If he saw that, all he would see is filthy rags. Because yeah. good works are considered as filthy rags in his eyes. Right. Isaiah, at the book of Isaiah. All right. 1 John chapter 1. The Bible says, verse 6, If we say that we have fellowship with him, See, Christian fellowship. If you say you fellowship with him, and what? Walk in darkness. If you do things in the dark, then the Bible says what? We lie and do not the truth. But if we walk in the light, as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another. So John, he's a saved apostle. Do you think he went to hell? Or did he went to heaven? He went to heaven, right? But he says we here. He realizes that he himself can what at verse 6 and 7? He can walk in darkness or walk in light. Right. He can fellowship with Jesus Christ or he can lose his fellowship in Jesus Christ. So notice that walking Christian fellowship, Christian walk is never ever the same as salvation. Never confuse the two. All right? If, if cults do that, I'm really sorry. Some of them may not be cults. They're just false preachers who don't know any better. But some of these people try to mingle fellowship and walk with your salvation. Yeah. Cut it off. Amen. That is wrong. Amen. All right. Now go back to... Uh, so then if you damage your walk and fellowship, what should you do? You do verse 9. If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. He'll repair your fellowship. He'll repair your walk. Amen. Going back to Ephesians 5. And uh, let's wrap it up here. Going back to Ephesians chapter 5. For the fruit of the Spirit. So Paul is saying that you should walk as children of light. Why? Because of the fruit of the Spirit. The fruit of the Spirit's sake. Is there fruit developing in your Christian walk? The fruit of the Holy Spirit that you should uh, bring forth for Him, notice that the Bible says three parts, is in all goodness, so all goodness, all right, and righteousness and truth. These are the three things that is labeled where you can have the fruit of the Spirit. So notice that these three things contradict. You notice that they contradict the things of the uh, filthiness, foolish talking, covetousness, jesting, etc. Did you notice the difference with those? So the fruit of the Spirit is obviously distinguished from your wicked flesh. Now let's talk about these three things. These are very important. And I'm going to go through them at a quick pace as much as possible. Goodness, righteousness, and truth. Now, before I discuss this, I better talk about the modern translations because they made a boo-boo, as they always did, right? <laughs> now, in the fruit of the Spirit that you're supposed to bring forth for Him, they think the modern translation says fruit of the light. They say light instead of Spirit. Now, uh, what's the problem with that? The problem is this. The problem is, is that it's not... The, uh, the Bible mentions, when you go to Galatians 6, go return to Galatians 6, it's the Holy Spirit that produces fruit. Right. 
That's important. It's the Holy Spirit himself that gives you fruit. Another thing is this. If you get rid of the word spirit in there and just put light, then how am I supposed to be assured that uh, I'm gaining more, that I'm being more filled with the spirit? Do you know the filling of the Spirit is one of the most important doctrines ever in your life? Yes, sir. And if you never heard of that basic doctrine, which is such a basic of basics, you should learn. Yes. It is an important subject. Every great, great Awakening revival preacher mentioned that their preaching is nothing without the filling power of the Holy yes. Spirit. That's how essential it is. So how am I supposed to be assured that I get the filling power of the Holy Spirit if you get rid of the word Spirit? Another thing is this, is that I don't think that it's a good idea, if, especially if I'm a translator of the Word of God, that I just uh, drop the word God, I drop the word Jesus, I drop the word Spirit. Yeah. I think that's a dishonor. Yep. These guys have no fear of the Lord in them. Right. All right, Ephesians uh, chapter, uh, Galatians, excuse me, chapter 5, verse 22. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace. So notice the fruit of the Spirit is mentioned here. Notice that the fruit of the Spirit is distinguished from verse 19 through 21. Works of the flesh. Notice that matches with Ephesians, right? Yeah. At verse 19, fornication, uncleanness. Verse 20, idolatry. Matches to a T with Ephesians. Right. So going back to Ephesians chapter 5, go back to Ephesians 5. The justification for the translation is, well, the context is light at verse 8. So we want to put light. No, if you look at the context, they don't go further back. They got to go as back as far back as verse 3. It's the flesh with its works right. contrasted with the fruits of the Spirit. Right. But you get rid of that context that matches with Galatians 5 when you put light in there. So proper context for your translation, which they can't even do a great job at, is more appropriate with Spirit. Going back to verse 9. So, do you want the filling power of the Holy Spirit? That's so, such a valuable asset. And the charismatics think that, oh, I'm filled with the Holy Ghost, Holy Ghost, Holy Ghost, and they make so much mention of the Holy Ghost that they don't even have an ounce of the filling of the Spirit, but just flesh. Mm -hmm. You want evidence? The evidence where you're filled with the power of the Holy Spirit is these three things. Let's look at that. The first one is in all goodness. Wow. Now, did you notice it says not just goodness, but what? All goodness. Now, some of you might be a good person. You might be good to people in the church. You Bible believers, you. You're good to people in this church. But there are just some things you're not good to the person about. Or you're good at the situation. Didn't God grant you all goodness upon you? Do you know how many verses are unlimited about God bestowing goodness upon you? And you go, the Lord is so good to me. That's why there are so many songs about God is good all the time. Yeah. All the time. So you should have the same thing too. If you don't have it, I don't care how much right doctrine you have in the church. The Holy Spirit is not in your church. Amen. Yeah. All right. Now, before you get all charismatic on me and say, oh, so you should be good to people and nice. And what's the big deal about doctrine? Ah, all right. Then. Notice the last part is truth. You have to speak truth. And I don't care how much goodness you show toward people. Come in as you are. You know, we love you in the Lord. But then you, te you let wrong doctrine slip in. The Holy Spirit is not in that place. You're no different from a typical liberal showing goodness to people. That's all secular humanism. That's very good. Why do you think I make a big deal about right doctrine? If you guys don't make a big deal about right doctrine, you're in trouble. And before you Bible believers go off balance and talk about right doctrine, right doctrine, right doctrine, you lack goodness yeah. for people. And then the next part, and both crowds don't like this. And living in California, I start to understand that more and more. But righteousness. The Holy Spirit is not in a church when you're worldly. Okay. It's got to be righteous. I don't care how much you call it legalism. All right? People tend to call what we do legalism. No, it's about righteousness. It's about holiness. Yeah, yes. That's why we don't have worldly stuff within our church. Amen. 
We make a big deal about the right mu to the T about right dressing, right music, right conversation, and the right activities and the right things to do in the church, even for children. All right? We make a big deal about righteousness. Otherwise, the Holy Spirit cannot be in our church, and he'll never bless that effort. Instead, it's flesh. Your church is flesh, man. All filled with flesh, something that pleases you. And that's churches today. Cater to the systems of the whims of the people, what pleases them. Then you are not in a Holy Spirit-filled church, and God cannot produce you fruit. When you brag about fruits, oh, these are all my fruits, all my fruits. No, there's a contrast. The Bible says fruits of the Spirit and the what? Works of darkness. You know what that is? Work of darkness. That is a work of darkness. How do I know it's a work of darkness? There were two million, uh, I'm, I'm exaggerating, but you know, they'll say like, there were like uh, 10,000 people who came to the meeting. They came to the meeting because we had, because you churches are super duper strict. But we loosen the rules and we love them who they are. And that's why we had 10,000 people. And you Bible-believing churches have less than 100. Ha, ha, ha. No, that's a work of darkness. You might say, no, look at my church membership. There's so many. No, the fruit is not your numbers. It's what? Uh, that's your fruit. Yep. You know what your members consist of? I'll tell you your fruit. You know why you're a work of darkness? Your yeah. members consist of this and this. Yeah. That's your fruit. Wow. That is your fruit. Amen, no matter how many people you both got saved or ended up in your church or even forsook uh, a false religion and endorsed Christianity, Satan don't care. Satan just uh, created the monster Roman Catholic Church right. considered to be Christian. He don't care. Right. As long, the point is as long as you disobey God. That's the point. Yeah. That's the point. Child of disobedience. He just wants some kind of action where you disobey God. That's his point. Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, I hope you learned a lot. So let's close with a word of prayer. Uh, before I close it, I got to combine it with verse 10. Otherwise, it's not going to make sense. Verse 10 says, proving what is acceptable unto the Lord. See that? All this, it proves that God accepts it. So then when these false churches do something that is not truth, it's not righteousness, and when you don't bestow goodness, guess what? That your worship service is not acceptable to the Lord, not even your attendance to church. All right, so let that be a lesson. Yeah. All right, I just had to nudge that sermon in. Let's close it with a word of prayer. God, my Father, I pray that today's uh, teaching mixed in, mixed in with preaching has been helpful to the hearers, edified them, and glorified your name. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.